All right, we are live. Welcome to Beastly Thoughts, episode 153. We've got a lot Ooh. to go over today, so none of this small talk shit, guys. Let's just jump right into it. What do you guys think? Small talk huh? shit. Get, get rid of all this extra extraneous bullshit, and let's talk no about more. some fucking video games. Yeah, no man. More. I've got to be honest. I didn't really give a shit about any of you anyway, so... Fuck <laughs> 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 you too, Gary. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> As I said in the '80s, that's what friends are for. Uh, that's Gary, what friends are for. Yes, keep smiling. <laughs> Damn, BC, you really you've been me. all over Twitter today, telling us about this game. Let's hear it. What have you been playing, man? The the big game I've been playing this week, and I beat it yesterday, was Little Nightmares, uh, a brand new game that just released for PlayStation Four, Xbox One, and PC. Uh, what it is is a, it's a a game in similar vein to Limbo and games like Inside. So you'll notice that graphical style. It's a third-person action puzzler. So there's lots of puzzles you're trying to escape. Uh, this game, is the, the storyline, or if you can call it that, the, the whole feel of the game is very similar to me. If you guys have seen a, an old anime by Studio Ghibli called Spirited Away, mm -hmm. where this little girl named Chihiro goes uh, with her mother and father. They're moving. They go through a tunnel, and some really crazy stuff happens. And she finds herself in this really fantastical world. Uh, full of danger and, and intrigue and characters that are just, you know, otherworldly. And the game is called Little Nightmares because a lot of the, the, the characters and creatures you run into in this game are ripped directly from your nightmares. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very stylistic game. When you see the characters in the world, it's like a very beautiful style game. But at the same time, they, they put so much detail into the enemies and, and the creatures that are after you. Like beautiful in like a nightmare before Christmas kind of way, right? That's it's like, what it is. It's very dark and grim, but gorgeous That's, that's animated. exactly what I called it. Uh, and that was the other half of what I said. It was like Studio Ghibli meets the Nightmare Before Christmas. It is a Nightmare Before Christmas style to it as well, but the world is very reminiscent of what you find in Studio Ghibli's uh, um, Spirited Away with this little girl, Chihiro. Uh, the game, you find yourself awakening in a strange world as a young girl. As you explore and look for a way out of this beautiful and terrifying world, you encounter beings that are horrifying and are dead set on killing and eating you. And it's really weird. Ooh. And the reason, I, uh, the reason I say that this game is very, yes, very uh, reminiscent to Spirited Away, a big pro uh, proponent or a big part of that film was these beings in this other world, like going all in eating, like a big smorgasbord. Everyone was eating and going crazy eating in Spirited Away. <laughs> And, and this game is very similar. You find yourself surrounded by beings that would love nothing more than to devour you immediately. But they're so, you know, into the moment eating at these tables that you're able to run through them. And if they see you, they'll reach out and try to grab you. And there were so many times in this game, my wife played right next to me. We basically beat the game within two minutes of each other uh, because she was playing on her TV. I was playing on mine. And we screamed out loud so many times. Uh, times playing this game. The game is a short game. It's only $20, and if you have $20 of expendable income, I say you should definitely pick it up. If you like games that are scary, but not, you know, Resident Evil 7 type of scary, but basically hide-and-seek type of uh, situations where there are creatures that look horrifying, they know you're there. There might be, for instance, be something that's blind, but it can smell you, and it's coming around the corner through a dark corridor and you're running and trying to get out of the way and hide under tables and it's reaching around trying to grab you it knows you're there uh those moments are very frightening and frantic and and the creatures let me just say if you guys your design uh, is fantastic yes it's really if, you, good. if you remember the books scary stories to tell in the dark uh back when i was a kid those were some of my favorite horror novels to read and the creatures in this game look like they're ripped directly from those books there's one creature the first one that you really come in contact with that really wants to get you it's just imagine a man and these everything in this game is gigantic so it the the character you are is about that big on the screen and and the things that she comes into contact with are huge like elephant size but they're in the shape or mold of i guess human beings but there's this guy whose feet his legs are about two inches long on the screen but his arms are about 20 inches long what? So it looks really creepy and scary when he comes looking for you and reaching for you. There was a part of the game where I was trying to escape him, and I thought I was out of his reach, and I saw his arm coming way up, and I jumped out of the way just as his arm reached it and grabbed exactly where I was at. And these moments scared the bejesus out of me. It was a great experience. Uh, the game has a great soundtrack. Uh, the puzzles that they, they use in this game for you to get to the next area are very um, unique. And I think that the story of this game will become unique to every person who plays it because the way that the, the, 
the story is told is really through your own experience. And at the end of the game, when you beat the game, it'll mean something different for each person, I think. It was a great game. Easley, talk to me about the controls a little bit, because that's the biggest concern I have about this game from watching it, is it does mm -hmm. look a little bit finicky. It looks like, you know, a lot of the time you might be trying to solve a puzzle, meaning you're trying to, like, escape something, and you may have the right idea, but for some reason the controls decided to fight you a little bit, and maybe you... Ooh. Well, I, I, I've had maybe one, possibly two instances of that. Uh, the game is a 3D type of puzzler, so it might look like you're actually on flat ground, but you don't know that if you walk forward or back a little bit, you'll slide off to your death. So sometimes you have to be extra aware. The control scheme like is very different. those old brawlers from the 90s, right? Yeah, it's like, like a double 3D. dragon. Yeah, yes. It has that kind of feel to it. And sometimes the camera pans out to show you a huge scene while you're actually playing, and you can make the wrong the wrong movement slightly go off. and Or you might open up a door and immediately walk to the other side of the door and fall off of the map because <laughs> you're not paying close attention to where your, your footing is. Also, the actual gameplay controls are a little bit different than what we're used to. Uh, the jump, the run buttons are all, you know, in different places than we're used to. In order to grab items, you got to hold down on PlayStation 4 the R2 button. In order to push things, it's the L2 button. So you, it takes a little bit of getting used to. The environments are completely, uh, everything in the world you can pretty much interact with. You can pick up things, you can pick up these little, I, I call them little pyramid heads. They look like gnomes, they're actually smaller than the girl. And if you capture them, they actually unlock um, uh, the concept art for the game, which really looks like uh, spirited away, believe it or not. Uh, and if you capture them, you can pick them up and throw them. Uh, you can use items to throw at enemies. Or you remember uh, the Monkey Shines uh, uh, film or the book? It shows the monkey on the front with the two bells and he ding, 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 oh, ding. Oh, yeah, ding. yeah. You, you'll find those throughout the game. They're just toys and shoes and crazy items. You can tell a lot of people like this little girl have actually been killed because there's one room that's filled with just I artifacts. saw that, the shoes. Ooh. Yeah, filled Yikes. with shoes and things like that. And you'll find toys. And like this little monkey, if you pick it up, and you throw it, it'll start making that sound, and you use that for certain enemies to like get them off track uh, or, or get them to go in a different direction so you can escape. Uh, one, it has of the, a one of the other concerns I have about this game is that it, while it's beautiful, the, the actual puzzle elements aren't that complex, right? Is uh, From what I've seen, it looks like you know it is pretty simple, like throw this thing to get them away from you and then run the other way. And the fact that you and your wife both finished it within five minutes of each other means that you probably weren't stuck on too many puzzles. You well, ran parts, right through this thing. The parts, well, there were there were parts that she was completely stuck on, and maybe she was five or ten minutes ahead of me. Uh, and and when I got to that part of the game without asking her for help, I tried it, and maybe I'd find it, and vice versa. So there were times that I was completely stuck, and she says, "Well, I tried this, and it worked." Then I'll go back and try it. Let me say about the puzzles. I don't know how much of this game that you actually saw, but there are some pretty deep puzzles in this yeah. game, and stuff stuff you would never think of. Uh, I'll just give an example. There's an, a portion of the game where you're on a table, and there's a meat grinder in front of you. Of course, it's a giant meat grinder, and and you um, what do you do? You uh, grab the little uh, handle and you start grinding the meat that's already inside the grinder. And you see like a little sausage link come out and you're trying to figure out how to get to the next area. You have to leave that room, go up above you, find some ham, open up a, a, a little trap door, drop the ham into the meat grinder from above, and then come down and, and make more sausages so you can jump onto those sausages to shimmy your way up and jump out into the next area. So there's just... You would That's never think cool. of that just looking at the game. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, there are these random encounters with these beings from hell. And, and like I told Kate, I've heard the term n numerous times in my life, but this is the first time that I actually said it on my own. This is nightmare fuel. When you see these things coming, you're like, oh, my God, this is something literally from, a, from my nightmare. Just seeing them and the way they interact, there's these big chefs. Everything in this game is like morbidly obese. There are these giant chefs whose faces look like they've just been destroyed, almost humanistic, but not really, who there's one scene where uh, he's cooking something like he's chopping up some raw meat and he goes to eat some of it. And he grabs his chin and lifts up his face and sticks his hand underneath his face and eats it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is what so <laughs> it's insane. Oh, I uh, love this already. Oh, my God. This I game is just a hell of a lot of fun. The moment I beat it. Uh, and I watched the ending. I, there's definitely, it has to be a part two. I pray it is. Uh, and when you find out where you are, what's going on in this game at the end, it's like a big eye opening moment. And at that time, you have to decide what really happened. And so I you, like, I like that. Uh, free basically, what you say, it's a horror game. I mean, 
what about for the people on you know amongst us gamers that are certified pussies like myself <laughs> that, <laughs> or Brian, you know we it's but yeah we, we enjoy <laughs> we enjoy horror games um, i started i started but, to go down that 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 uh, rabbit hole a moment ago when i said it's not a horror game like resident evil nothing ever feels like you're in a dire type of strait i mean it's horror but it's horror that kids can deal with <laughs> You know, I let mm. my four-year-old play this game, and the thing that frustrated her the most is the puzzles, not the enemies. Mm. Um, so it's definitely, Briar, I would love to see you stream this. I would love to see it, because, you know, I call myself a manly man, but I was screaming like a bitch uh, mm. during certain parts of this game where these things were <laughs> after you. And something something is very off-putting about the character design of these enemies. The way that they look, it seems so real. It seems like a nightmare. It looks like... Uh, uh, Coraline or some one of, one of these yeah. uh, very stylized films that have come out over the last few years for children, but it's a beautiful game. It plays, it's fun. It's it's fun to play. It plays well. It looks and I great. Would say, it looks fantastic. Any, yeah. it, give it a try. It's twenty dollars. I think you guys can all you know afford that. And I only available you, on PlayStation right now. No, it's on Xbox One and PC as well. So if you oh. want to get it on your PC, I would say do that. If you wanted the absolute best experience, I didn't uh, see any graphical hiccups on the PS4. I was playing on the Pro, didn't notice any issues with it. But of course, if you want the best optimal experience, it's probably on the PC. What's the name but, of the uh, game again? I forgot. Little, little Little Nightmares. Little Nightmares. It's really good. I promise you, you will love that game. I think I'm gonna pick this up. I think I will pick it up for PC so I can play it. Uh, I think you just sold me too. Yeah, I think well, I will pick it up and play it on the. Uh, that way, I can play it up here, or I can play it on the TV downstairs on the stream. Yeah, it's it's a great game, uh, you know, and I don't go on Twitter too much talking about the games I play, but it's uh, I don't know how many people have been. Why spreading. do you hate people on Twitter? Let's investigate that. that. No, what, what the hell? No, you're not sharing not, your knowledge with the people on Twitter. You're you're keeping it to yourself. What's up with that? I, I yeah. guess what I keep what's in my X Files to myself. I'm not telling <laughs> you, telling you nothing. But it's, yeah, I I would definitely say to to try this game, guys. It's great, Gary. You're a hardcore gamer. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this game after playing it. Uh, I know you got the special edition you showed us on Twitter, right? Yeah, I just held it up just then, just for people that want to know. Um, it actually comes on the consoles, not the PC version, but there's a physical box that comes with a nice little statue That's and so some beautiful, and man. some other things. Um, and also, for people who are interested, if you're talking about multiplat on the PS4, there is apparently pro support, uh, pro enhancement. So whether that's 4K or whether that's additional shading, I'm sure that it must look stunning on that. I, thought Beast, I, uh, I watched a giant bomb video on it. I think they said that it was 60 frames per second. Oh, okay, fantastic. Then it's as good as PC. Can't beat that. And see, the thing with my PlayStation Pro, and I'll probably end up taking my 4K 60 inch in the living room and swapping it out. I can't capture PlayStation Pro 4K assets on my gra on my my Elgato, and that's a real issue for me. Let's talk, so, Beasley. Let's huh? talk. <laughs> okay. I'm working on it. Okay, great. <laughs> Sounds good to me, man. Anything else, Beasley? Uh, I did a little. The Call of Duty Modern Warfare, I mean, Modern Warfare, World War II reveal happened, and that kind of got me and my wife uh, excited for the future of Call of Duty. Yeah. Going back to boots, boots on the ground, it looks great. The trailer is the first trailer for Call of Duty to me that really got me excited in a really long time. Uh, the trailers for the last couple of years have been kind of lacking. And, and when I saw this trailer, I was like, wow, this looks like it's going to have a hell of a campaign. It looks realistic. It looks like it's going to be great. And I can't wait to play it. Let me play some Call of Duty. So I spent a few hours throughout the week playing Infinite Warfare, which I didn't like nearly as much. And so I went back to uh, Black Ops 3 and played that for a while. I probably put about four or five hours just back into it just to, you know, to get my, my feet wet again. But ultimately, I ended up walking away from it because there's, it doesn't offer me anything new at this point. So I'm I hoping still have my coffee, copy of Call of Duty 2 for the really? Xbox 360. Really? Yeah, it was like a launch game for the 360. I still have a copy of that. I should throw you can that play out. it on Xbox One as well. Is it back compatible? Yep. Good. I've got it on PC still. The Everything box. on Xbox 360 yeah. is like backwards compatible now. Microsoft has been killing it with backwards compatibility. Yeah, they have man. been. They have been. They have really been yeah. killing it. It's been insane. And that's been my that's been my games for the week. I had a great time. I think that Little Nightmares really capped my weekend. And uh, I'm excited to hear what you guys have been playing. Robbie, you've been playing some Call of Duty too, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, pretty much the same as Beast. Played the World War II reveal really got me excited, so I went back and played some Call of Duty as well. Do we want to talk uh, about the world the, the reveal now, or is that going to be in the news later? It's the first, the first bit thing of in the news. news. Okay, yeah. so we'll talk about the reveal. Okay, 
We'll talk about it soon. Okay. Uh, so yeah, first <laughs> Call of Duty game I tried out was Ghosts, and I know Briar. Obviously, you and I like we know Ghosts got kind of a bad rap. I personally yeah. really like the game, like you do. I think the only issue I had with it was some of the maps were a little large. You know, it would yeah, take sure. a long time to find people. But it's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, and I just wish the player count wasn't so small because there is like a thousand people playing on PS4, which is such a shame because I think the game's fun. I really do. I do. I, I love that game. It, it was. I, I really do love that game. How many yeah, Call of Duties have released since Ghost? There's been three three releases, three. right? Yeah. Advanced Warfare, Black Ops uh, Three, and uh, Infinite Warfare, and then yeah. COD Remastered as well. With it, oh, was, uh, yeah. was oh, right. Ghost yeah. released on the Wii U, wasn't it? I think Ghost was on the Wii U. I don't. Recall, yes, was it? it was. Yeah, it was. And I want to see the player population was. on that one. How many oh, people are playing Wii U Ghost right now? <laughs> we actually had a guy on this podcast one time who mained Wii U on that game. Breather really? Hutton noobs. Really? Remember when we had him on? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he made yeah, he... Wii U for that game. I think he did for Black Ops Two as well. Black Ops Two, yeah. yeah, yeah. He did. That was his favorite. Yeah. Man, how's that he, working out for him? Right he used now? to <laughs> love beating up on them kitties. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he was a great guy. We should have him on again. I really enjoyed yeah. him. Yeah, he's a good guy. So what? What are you thinking now, Robbie? You're playing. You're playing. You played Ghost? Did you play any of the other ones? Infinite Warfare, did you say? I've played pretty much all of them. The next one I tried was Advanced Warfare, and I will say, fuck that game. Seriously, like, I don't <laughs> even... I don't understand. Like, I liked it when it came out. I got kind of burnt out on it. I tried playing it this week. It's just, you're jumping and boosting all over the place. It just feels like a mess. I was like, I don't like this. Shut the game down. Went and played some Call of Duty 4 Remastered and had a way better time with that, man. And I know... People have been kind of upset about the whole, you know, supply drops and microtransactions and they've added a new map pack to the game. But aside from all that, the core game is a lot of fun because it's the most classic Call of Duty there is and it feels good to play. And I've been having a blast of that. That's been really fun. Mm -hmm. Also been playing Infinite Warfare, which I will surprisingly say I had fun with too, although it pisses me off the amount of bullshit in that game like my god there's just so many grenades that seek onto you and there's like drones flying around and it's yeah. just it's ridiculous it's fun but it's just it makes me so mad i'm like they just tried to put too much into this game i put so. an hour into the multiplayer of that mm -hmm. robbie and when i realized how easy it was to quick scope i was like why would you use any other weapon <laughs> like there's that's like, the thing too yeah the sniping was unbelievable ridiculous so, i've got a question for you about the the call of duty and the whole boost jump in and sliding and, and wall running why is it that on call of duty there's such a violent response when it moves in that direction but on destiny people applaud the movement system that's gone that way is oh, it the time to kill no it's that that was destiny's first game and, and destiny kind of came out with something new at that time it was what Briar called the year of the double jump uh, <laughs> i remember yeah. it and, and destiny didn't have its lineage on the ground you know, like Call of Duty did. Call of Duty started off with many games just strictly on the ground, and then they went to the future and became futuristic weapons, and then futuristic movement, which was off-putting to a lot of people who started initially playing the game when it was boots on the ground, and they loved it for what it was, and you know, originally. So I think that was what a lot of the uproar was about, is that a lot of people felt, and I think Briar included, felt like it didn't feel like Call of Duty. I, I actually remember when Advanced Warfare came out, and we talked about it on this show a few years ago, Briar said it. He said, it doesn't feel like Call of Duty to me. And I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of that uh, came from the, the aspect of the change in movement. Um, and I got to say, at this point, I kind of agree with it. I think that Black Ops 3 kind of toned it back from Advanced Warfare. But when you think about Call of Duty in its infancy and what made it great, and what made it, you know, a renowned game around the world, it was just boots on the ground, tactical, you know, it was running a, gun. It was a really nice play. blend between tactical, but also arcadey. Yeah, like, run, it was running fast, gun, yeah. but also there was a there was a mind game in there, too. Mm -hmm. So you think it's its attachment to the to the COD brand? The reason I say that is obviously Destiny's got an advanced movement system, and then games like Titanfall, which Titanfall Two was was widely applauded as a really well put together game with a solid multiplayer, mm -hmm. but that had, you know, Call of Duty on LSD sort of movement. It was real well, quick, fluid movement, but there was praise map for that design. Game. I think is a big deal too. You look at yeah. Titanfall's and Titanfall yeah. 2's map design. It seems like. They were built from the ground up with this new movement style in mind, right? Especially Titanfall 2. Titan Titanfall 2's maps are superb. They are. When you look at Advanced Warfare's maps, it was like they were designed to be boots on the ground maps. And all of a sudden, there's fucking people flying all over the place. Like, it yeah. didn't make any That's sense. That's the thing, too. And, and, I know when I was playing Advanced Warfare, you just 
bump into stuff all the time. I'm like, this just feels so cumbersome. It's weird. Like it, it really does. Yeah. And, and you'd probably see the same kind of backlash in games like Destiny Two or a Kill Zone. I mean, Kill Zone or Titanfall Three if they made it strictly boots on the ground in the future. People who played it originally would be upset because they changed the original movement from what started the franchise off. So if right. Titanfall Three just had straight boots on the ground. And you couldn't double jump, you couldn't wall run. People would be upset because it's not what made them come to the franchise in the first place. And so the reverse is that what you see with Call of Duty in the last few years has been the case. Interesting. No, I just wanted to explore that point. Thank you. Gary, what I mean for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Robbie. I was just going to add in real quick that um, for me, I mean, I like the movement system. Personally, not Advanced Warfare. I really now, I don't like that game. I think every other Call of Duty I have enjoyed. Black Ops 3 and Infinite Warfare, not as much as the older ones, just because it felt like more of the same, right? Like, that did feel like Call of Duty, but it was just with a new movement system. So, you know, I still enjoy those games, but not as much as the past. But that's it. All right. Gary, what have you been up to? So, apart from buying PlayStation Vitas, which... He bought a lot <laughs> of them. <laughs> Saving the Vita. Show, show them you, what you Gary. got, please, Gary, because uh, you're the man. You are the fucking uh, man that comes to Vita. I don't know if I have props to hand, but um, I'll show one that I've got here. Now, I've been buying some out-of-print um, classic Vitas. So the um, in Japan, they, they printed Vitas. something. <laughs> classic Vitas. Classic. No, in Japan, um, they released a Cosmic Blue, and, sorry, Cosmic Red and, a, and an Alpha Sapphire uh, original Vita. Um, so I've, I've purchased so the um, yeah no they're all all kinds yeah of, that looks good man see the see the thing I there. like that um, so I've been I bought, I bought both of those um, and it kind of is, is becoming a, a slight obsession now I should probably stop buying them before I have to sort of sell the sell the kid and, and remortgage the house um, <laughs> don't do that. That. but yeah the um, that's kind of got me into the um, into the mindset of of sort of playing the library that I've bought I mean I'm up to about sixty five games now on the Vita. Um, and one series that I really wanted to dig into, and it's not Vita exclusive, so please don't tune out if you don't have a Vita. Uh, it's the God Eater series, which I don't know if, if any of you guys got any familiarity with God Eater whatsoever, or do you want me to take it from the top? Um, a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I know about God Eater, but you should definitely talk about it from the top for people who don't know. Great. So it's uh, God Eater is a series that's on the PS4, the PS Vita, and more recently Steam. So it is on PC. So if you don't have a PS4 or Vita, you can still experience it. It's very um, much in the vein of Monster Hunter. So it's a beast hunting game, cooperative, very much based around online or local co-op. Effectively, you're in squads of four, solo or squads of four, and you go out and you take down huge beasts. Where it differs from Monster Hunter and where I think it's it's worth exploring as something that's not just a Monster Hunter clone, which it often gets labelled with, is the fact that the action is far more frenetic than the Monster Hunter slower, more considered and thoughtful action. And, and Monster Hunter does that intentionally because it, it punishes uh, poor play and wants you to move precisely and strike precisely. So for me, I like the, the Bayonetta feel, you know, the, the Devil May Cry feel near automata feel if you want to say that you get with god eater in the in the combat side of things and that's something that i've, I've really really enjoyed so basically you said that you've, you've played a bit of god eater have you actually got got into the combat what was your thoughts i know you're a fan of uh, actually of the, the first time i experienced god eater was actually on the psp uh god eater has been around for a long time it came out on the ps3 in japan as well uh, I'm, I'm a fan of the monster hunter style games uh, i probably put it at the well, it's been so many years at this point. I probably put just five or six hours in on God Eater before something else came in and captured my attention. But uh, from the from what I do remember, I did enjoy the game. But those games are very hard. You've got to master lots of skills. Uh, there's so many things you got to find in the world and craft. And uh, for me, you know, being my age, the, the the patience just wears thin, and I go to something that's a little bit easier, like Hello Kitty Island Adventure. So that's when <laughs> I think like God Eater. I think that's where God Eater really differentiates itself from the pack, and that's exactly my uh, great transition. It's almost like we rehearsed it. It's like like we've got a plan for the show. I like it. Um, great. Monster Hunter is, is unapologetic in the way that it forces you to grind for resources, crafting materials, and go through that pain of upgrading your armor, upgrading your weapon. The fluidity of gameplay in God Eater, um, it, there's constant progression. You're always moving through. The, the weapons and equipment is, is crafted on the fly. It's something, so you've still got depth, but it's not depth that requires hours and hours of grinding to get through. And that's something that I really enjoyed. Uh, similarly as well with God Eater, 
I said Monster Hunter's got a generic fantasy medieval background. Like you kill in Lagiacrises and Naga Cougars and Rathians and Rathalosses just because they're there. Um, you're defending a town because you happen to have showed up as a monster hunter. Mm. There's really no overarching story to it other than this town's being besieged by monsters. God Eater's got a really, really strong deep lore in it. In fact, they actually made a 14 series, uh, sorry, 14, 14 parts anime series, which is available on Crunchyroll and completely backs up the game and takes it through. So you've got about 500 minutes, somewhere in the region of, of eight to 10 hours of quality anime that, that really enriches this uh, this lore and story that carries through. It feels like equal parts Pacific Rim with John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, um, so it's, it's a really entrenching and, and deep story and something that even if you're not an anime fan, if you're a fan of sci-fi and a fan of post-apocalyptic monster or a kaiju movies, um, it really fits in. So for me, that's that's been great. Moving on to, I guess, what's why you should play this and why it's a, it's a great feature. Uh, if you pick it up on the PlayStation franchise, you get two unique elements to it. One being cross-play and cross-save. I can't speak highly enough of games that have cross-play and cross-save for the Vita and the PS4 because effectively what you get is Switch Lite. So with cross-play, uh, it means that the people that own PS Vitas can play with PS4 gameplay uh, owners. So BC, I know that you've got yourself and your wife that play in the house. If she were to have God Eater on the Vita, you could play it on the PS4 and you could be in a hunting party together and each have your own screen and play cooperatively. So yeah. that's something that's... Or if we got divorced, we could still play together. It's awesome. It's perfect. Play with your ex-wife, and that's one well, of the Hopefully that points. doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I didn't hear you, Briar. I think you're muted. <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and um, cross-save effectively gives it that, um, that switch-like aspect. So I can be playing on my PS4, do three or four missions, realize that I need to go to work and actually uh, earn some money rather than playing games all day, um, flick the save over onto the Vita, uh, play on my commute, get another three or four hours in throughout that day, come back and continue on my PS4 when I get home. And there was actually about 50 titles that supported this seems to go under publicized for the visa so things like final fantasy 10 10 2 world of final fantasy borderlands 2 dragon's crown binding of isaac um you know odin sphere all of these games have that capacity to yeah, have the switch let me, like let me aspect. ask you a question i i really enjoy the cross play uh functionality as well but a bigger question is is it cross by it's not cross by but there is a really really great value feature that you get with god eater 2 for the playstation 4 so if you buy it on the vita or the ps4 you get that psp game um, that you mentioned beastly the god eater resurrection mm -hmm. you get the entire first game remastered into hd graphics given to you so that's 150 hours of gameplay on top of the 150 hours you get with god eater 2 completely free of charge when you buy it so it's a really good value proposition to the, the yeah. entire franchise for I guess it came out six months ago, so you're probably going to pay maybe forty dollars for it now. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a good deal. I may end up uh, going out and picking that up because, uh, especially the aspect of being able to play online with your friends, uh, that's something I'm really looking forward to. I haven't played my Vita in quite a, quite a while. I think I turned it on after last week's show and played a couple of games with my daughter. Uh, but you've kind of re-sparked that fire in me. I don't know if it's getting to you yet, Briar, but uh, I actually watching did Gary... turn mine on. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I played. Oh. Uh, what was that? Side scrolling, uh, ah, it'll come to me later. It was a fun game, though. Okay, uh, yeah, but but listen to Gary talk about these games, a lot of them which I've never played, is kind of excited me. I'm like, well, I could easily be playing that right now. It sounds great, and I, I think that the whole mobile thing with the Nintendo Switch, like he said, it's refueled or, or, or rekindled this fire inside him to play games on the go, and 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 seeing his collection for the Vita in such a short period of time, and how much time he's invested in some of these games and the way he's able to come back so quickly and give us these meaningful reasons to try them out. It's kind of gotten me excited. I haven't been this excited for a man in a long time, Gary. <laughs> I like, you know, for me, if I've excited at least one man in a week, it's a week well spent. So that's um, that's kind of what I've done now. I've got two other honorable mentions. You got me which excited too. You've two, <laughs> men two, excited. Men, two men. This is, this is a, a dream. Um, I've yes. got two other honorable mentions um, for the week, which are just throw away things because most of my time has been spent with the the vita and the ps4 um on on god eater uh, persona 5 continued through it absolutely loving it still progressing that campaign really let me live the otaku life of uh, a japanese schoolboy which <laughs> is oddly satisfying um 
and then Kamiko for the Nintendo Switch. Have any of you guys picked that up? It was released on the eShop for five dollars this week. Right. No, is that I the Zelda like it. game? It is. It, it's it very much um is reminiscent of Zelda. It's an eight bit dungeon crawler, but it looks like Zelda. It plays like Binding of Isaac, and it's Whoa. not you you'd buy into it for five dollars <laughs> thinking I'm going to get a Link to the Past sort of long, sprawling RPG. It's not like that at all. It's a game for speedrunners, if anything. You can complete the game in somewhere around 90 minutes. So there's four characters, four with individual um, storylines and, and unique abilities. Each one has about 90 minutes worth of gameplay, but it's fast action and it works great on the Switch. So if you're looking for something to pick up, which is an indie game, but something that conjures back that Zelda feel uh, with a Binding of Isaac kind of speed of, of gameplay and rapidity, pick up Kamiko. You know, it's it's $5, so it's it's really not a huge time. That sounds like fun, $5. actually. I might pick that up for $5. Why not? Real yeah. quick, uh, before you get to your last mention, uh, Gary, I know that the new Mario Kart has shipped for the uh, Nintendo Switch. Any of you guys pick that up yet? No? Yeah. Okay. Gary has. Yeah, I have. I have I like um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I didn't get a chance to yet, but that's definitely on my radar this week. So, yeah, I've actually played it um, twice since since we bought. We we only picked it up met myself and the fiance picked it up um, just because we we have to have all the things, um, and we, <laughs> we <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, we wanted to test out how well it would work um, with the whole Switch advert. You know, two people pick up a Switch and have a little go on the on the Joy Cons, one Joy Con each, playing oh. on split screen. Yeah, um, we we played it in bed, you know, romantic. It's uh, it's kind of like Mario Kart four play, I call it. Yeah. Um, no, we just yeah, no, we 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 uh, it didn't get excited. Under the we covers at night with Gary Diaz. We rolled over and went to sleep. <laughs> just Mario I promise you, it was, it was pretty, those sheets. Pretty sad. Um, but the way it, it works is a split screen. It does a vertical split screen rather than a horizontal, so you get a decent amount of track each. And if you're sitting there um, on a, on a tabletop or in bed or on the sofa with each other, the, the Joy-Cons actually work really well when you put that wrist strap uh, adapter on top of them. Uh, yep. I mean, I have small childlike hands, but, you know, I guess, it, you know, your mileage may vary if you've got larger bear claws. But, you know, it works. If you have friggin' gorilla hands, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's it, it works exactly as, as you intended it to. You know, the, the, the Nintendo commercial, I felt like I was playing it. And um, yeah, it was so, great so, fun. So for you, turning the, the control of the Joy-Con sideways did feel, it felt natural playing Mario Kart with, with your uh, with your fiance. Absolutely. There was a bit of a, um, a struggle in, in getting it working, like each person having the Joy-Con, because when you're navigating the menus to go onto two players, you you've obviously turn it got, sideways, yeah. you've got the Joy-Cons attached. You disconnect them, and then all of a sudden you have to reconnect as different players. And, and yeah, that would it be was, weird. It was a bit fiddly, but we yeah we figured it out. And once you're in there, 60 frames per second maintained. It looked great. It, it didn't feel like the screen was too small or restrictive to play it. Uh, mm -hmm. We played a couple of Grand Prix and a few battle modes. Probably played it for about an hour and a half, um, and really enjoyed it. It was really functional. So I've got to say that's uh, definitely worth picking up if you want to live that Nintendo fantasy of, of playing tabletop with your friends when you're out and about. God, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, last one, I won't get into it then because I'm conscious that we've deviated on, was Planet Side 2. Um, oh, which yeah. Free to play yep. first person shooter. Uh, available on the PS4. I don't know if it's available on the Xbox One live store. Also on Maybe. PC. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's, not on, it's not on the Xbox One. It's not. Okay, so I um, played that for a while. Feels like um, if you fused Destiny and Battlefield 1 into a large, open, sprawling campaign shooter. Uh, very much like that. The shooting mechanics actually felt really tight. Uh, the ship combat and the, the vehicular combat was really good. I think I need to give it a bit more time, but it's free. There is, um, I guess, bolt-on things that you can buy to increase the amount you can level and, and other things there, which you'd expect in a free-to-play game. But yeah, definitely one that I'm going to explore this week. So it wasn't disappointed by it. But that's it for me. Thank you. Great. It sounds like you had a great week. I may go ahead and doubt. I think I already have Planet Side to uh, install on my PS4. I just haven't had any friends to play I've it with. I've just never played it. Yeah, yeah it, it's a it's a lot of fun, Robbie. You got friends right here. Hey, man, you guys don't play games with me. I've been begging you bitches all week. To play games <laughs> you with have me. for weeks now. Yeah, shit. we're sorry. I know. I want to hear that shit. So, uh, Garrett, if you're down, we I'll jump in there with you. Dude, it's well, like well, real life, though, you know? I have all these friends I text, and then sometimes I just forget to reach out to them for months. I'm like, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't talked to you in forever. It's so hard to get time friend. with Briar. Briar's like the celebrity of the group. I was it's asking like, you guys you know, to play on Tuesday. 
Yeah, but you 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 jumped over the games that we were already scheduled to play, man. I, I, I didn't know about to... this schedule. This schedule was not scheduled with me. Hey, <laughs> yeah. hey listen. Hold every on. Tuesday, Briar, you, myself, and Rob agreed to play an hour video game every Tuesday. Like right, and I called ago. you guys on Tuesday. I and said, every let's Tuesday, play some my player unknown. <laughs> I yeah. couldn't, though. So, so we, first things first. We got to get some VR going, and then we can start figuring out what we'll do from there. But whatever you guys want to play, I'm down, man. Come on. You know how to do it. Anyhow, I'm going to talk about what I have been playing, and that mm -hmm. is Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Nice. Uh, Gary, you talked about it, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. When I saw this game come up, I said, it's another one of these, you know, like King of the Hill games. Yep. Early release. It's going to be janky as hell. Like, okay, whatever, <laughs> you know. Uh, I finally, I watched a couple of streams of it and I decided to download it. It's about 30 bucks on steam. I got to tell you, I enjoy the shit out of this game. It's, it's not going to be a game that, you know, like I devote my entire life to, but it is really fun to spend an hour. Just like basically the setup is you, you know, you, you join a lobby of a hundred people, you get on a plane, uh, your plane flies over a map of this huge Island and at any point, you can get off of that plane. You parachute off the plane, kind of pick your spawn point, uh, and then start rummaging through all the houses and warehouses and all the buildings on this island trying to get the best weapons you can so that you can be the sole survivor of these 100 people. And you basically go around uh, shooting anybody you see, avoiding anybody that's more powerful than you. And uh, meanwhile, the playable space on this island is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and making everybody come together uh, to this How is that spot. happening? How is, how it's is like this laser is... wall or some shit. It's, you just, yeah, it's oh, like if you get outside of the first, laser yeah. wall, you start taking constant damage. Uh, so yeah. you have to stay inside that laser wall for the most part, although there's some very good strategies about staying right on the edge of that on that wall. Yeah, um, and there's airstrikes as well, uh, bro, isn't there? Like that's right. There's random airstrikes and stuff like that. <laughs> the crux of the game, though, is... Get on the ground, find guns, find armor, start shooting people, try to be the last man standing out of that 100 people. And the game feels good. The controls work. It, you know, there's definitely some, there's some bugginess to it, but not much. It's definitely not as much as I've seen in games like DayZ or H1Z1. It's a very playable game. It controls well. The inventory system works like you expect it to. Uh, and it's fun to play. It takes anywhere from... 10 to 30 minutes to play a game through of it. And so many times this week, I've been like, just one more game, <laughs> just one more game. In fact, on I think it was Wednesday night. I did a stream. I expected the stream to be two to three hours. I think it was like more like four hours. And the whole time I'm just like one more game, one more game. It was it's so long, addictive. Yeah. It was like long. you just get to, you get to the point where, you know, you, maybe you die number 78 and you're like, Oh, I could do better than that. Let's, let's play another one. And then you get to, you know, you get to top 20 and you're like, shit, I was so close. Let's do another one. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just, just so addictive. Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember how far you got in your best game? Do you remember? The best I've ever done is top five. I think it was really, yeah, it was, it was like three or four. Maybe I, maybe I even got down to two. I've never won one. Um, relatively frequently i'll get down to top 20 but you can pretty much do that just by you know staying hidden right um but a lot is of there... the time i'll die in like the 80s <laughs> you know, like i'll, do, I'll yeah. jump down into a i'll jump down into a heavily populated uh city and i'll just take my chance i'll just try and find a gun as soon as possible and it's just a if you go into a city right off the bat like there's going to be at least probably five or six other people in that city with you and they are going to be looking for blood Right, and you might go into a building and find you open a door on one side of a building. You see across the other way, the back door is already open. You're like, oh shit, there's somebody in here, <laughs> and you you know you got a choice right there. Do I run or do I try and find this guy? Meanwhile, one of the great things about the game is the sound design is spot on, so yeah. that when somebody's creeping around, either they're outside a building that you're in or they're upstairs in the building that you just came in. You can hear it so really? well. It's very this. It's it's like how I used to feel playing like older Call of Duty games, where the sound was half of the input, because like you can hear gunshots going off in the distance. You can pretty much tell how far away, you know that that gun battle is, and to know how safe you are 
based on the the sound of those gunshots. You can hear them, you know, right down the street, and you can hear them if they're happening in the building that you're in. The footsteps are amazing. Like they really do. You can very well track 3D positionally where the enemy is based on the footsteps. Um, so that brings a lot of joy to me because it's it, like I don't I don't play with music. I got to turn the music all the way down. And it's very rare for awesome. me to play without music. Yeah, I remember I'm loving that, that game. Ab- I remember when the ability to like sound whore and listen for people in Call of Duty went away. That you actually said it frustrated the hell out of you. It, it's it frustrates that- me in Destiny too. It's like it's not that's not a thing in Destiny at all. And like that's one of your no. main sources of input for the outside world is your ears and games that don't have that. It's it's, it's missing. Games that do it well and Player Unknown's Battlegrounds does it very well. Uh, it it adds to the experience in a huge way. And the gun sounds are loud and they sound good. And you got to have that volume cranked up because you want to be able to hear somebody creeping around outside, you know. So you. So can then all of a sudden, when somebody does surprise you with gunshots, yeah. you're like, "Oh yep. shit!" Because <laughs> it's fucking loud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you mentioned as well, Brian, that it being early access and it it potentially being labeled as all the other early access games that are going to stay there. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know if you've seen the frequency of patches that have been hitting that game, and the fact it's now got a test server. Yeah. It feels yeah, so- to me like week on week when you play it, you feel the bugs being squashed, and you feel it moving closer towards a release product. They've added balancing patches already. Like, they've they've done things with the balancing. They, like, they, it does feel like they have care, and they are trying to get this game to be a great. And it's very popular. It's, I, yeah. I got a... I got a quick question about Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Um, what is is there a prize or what are you just going for? Like, if you get number one, do you get chicken something dinner. special? You're the winner, Say winner, what? chicken dinner. You're just the winner, yeah. <laughs> you, there is a there's a there's a monetary system of some sort. It's like a reward system where uh, the longer you you survive and the uh, more people you kill, you get awarded more points, which you can then spend on uh, packages that have cosmetic items in them, so you can like kind of customize the look of your character. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I mean, it's heavily risk reward as well. So, like, um, in addition to what Brian said around the sneaking and, and different strategies, there's also supply drops that happen sequentially throughout it. So, there'll be a plane that comes over and drops a flare down that's got a ghillie suit and snipers and all these really, really powerful equipment and weapons. You can either play for that drop or you can play to shoot people that come for that drop. Or you can ignore it altogether, knowing that that's going to take a load of people out the map. So there's some some real strategy in combat that goes into it. So, I mean, I, I'm I put my cards on the table and say I am awful at that game. Um, it's I'm good bad. Fun, I'm bad too. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy, enjoy the it. hell out of it though. Um, one of the things I really want to do because I've only played it solo at this point, and you can have mm-hmm. teams. You can, and the great thing is too is it sets, separates you by how big your team is. So if you're a solo player, you only play other solo players. If you're playing as two people, doubles, you only play other teams of two. And then once you go above teams of two, you get started mixing in with, you know, different size teams. But yep. I I really want to get a uh, team going because the communication and the teamwork that go into something like this really it yep. really looks like it's a lot of fun. So I've only played solo so far. I'm definitely looking to uh, get a team going and try that experience out as well. So I can't I, wait to play it. I remember Gary talking about this. This is only on Steam. What's the cost for it? 30 bucks. I may go ahead and pick it up this week. I got to find some way to play with you, Briar. You're so busy. Man, it's, All right. It is a fun game. I am not done talking, though. Oh, I'm sorry. I got one more <laughs> thing. It's not so much a game that I'm playing as a game that I will be playing very, very soon, and that's Destiny 2. So on May 18th, I'm going out to L.A. to play Destiny 2. Uh, at their reveal event. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be hard coming back, uh, playing Destiny 2, and then playing coming back Destiny and playing 1. Destiny for another five months while I'm waiting <laughs> for Destiny 2 to come out. Uh, but I'm really excited about it. Uh, we did see that uh, there were packages sent out. There was a little bit of story revealed about Destiny 2. Uh, it looks like the ghosts are dead. We are cut off from the light. You know, it says, like, what's it? A world Welcome to a light. world without light. Uh, So, you know, there are going to be significant changes in this game. We already know that we're getting cut off from our vaults. We're not going to have any of our weapons or armor or equipment moving forward to Destiny 2. It looks like this will also mean that we're not going to have access to our superpowers. You know, our our space magic. Supers. You know, like supers, grenades, like all of that stuff is going to get reworked like it should for a sequel. 
Uh, but this seems like a very good story set up to do it. So uh, let me ask you a question, Briar. Uh, when you go to this event on May 18th, are you going to be allowed to talk about what you experienced? or As far as I know, yeah, I would okay. think so, yeah. And I'm I, guessing I, after you come back May 18th, we should expect another crackhead, one more taste of Destiny video. I remember mm, possibly. Years, <laughs> yeah. oh, Just make sure you do the hair all crazy, yeah. please. I Maybe I, I cut my hair too soon. Too. <laughs> so, bro, there's something I've been thinking about um, yeah. since since I saw that headline about a world without light. Do you think, or have you given any thought to the fact that Bungie might be doing a bit of a bait and switch with the Cabal? So the reason I say that is the Cabal have got the firepower to come in and, and potentially disable the Traveller, whether they destroy it or whether they just subdue it or mm -hmm. put a, a force field around it to block our light from it. But the imagery seems to be far darker, far more, you know, darkness driven. So whether it's Hive, yeah. whether it's core darkness, do you think the Cabal are going to be the, the main antagonists or do you think this is the introduction to who the main antagonists are going to be moving forward? I've thought about that too, Gary. Like if you, if I was going to design Destiny 2, right, like why not design a whole story arc for the whole, you know, for the whole game with all the DLCs? And it starts with us getting, you know, knocked off. You know, it, Destiny 1 it ends with Age of, Age of Triumph, right? And we're at our our highest peaks ever. We're the most powerful we've ever been. And then the cabal come knock us on our asses, you know, r ruin everything that we've got. It, that's a really good point though. It's like, wouldn't you want to build a overarching story that, so it doesn't feel piecemeal all the way through destiny Two's existence. But I, I yeah. do think you're probably right there, Gary. It's just for your reveal trailer. Would you put, the big reveal or would you just maybe no. put a a vehicle to to start it so is Gaul going to be or gary if you want to say is he going to be the main villain for destiny 2 and to me he feels like a almost like a filler villain you know, i think he will be the the, the main villain for the launch but i think we might f start seeing maybe like at the end of the story th that we play we might start to see like the the strings that are like kind of guiding all these dark forces you know maybe we'll start getting looks at like the bigger whatever this darkness is like this malevolent force you know like yeah i wouldn't expect to defeat the darkness of destiny 2 or any of its dlc right that's going to be in destiny 5 <laughs> yeah. yeah but the, i wouldn't the, the... i wouldn't be surprised to see the tendrils start to make connections you know because the more i resonate on it and the more i think about it the cabal to me don't feel like a nemesis they don't feel adversarial in the same way that some of the other races do the cabal feel like a militarized force and something that we overcome but to me they don't feel like the big bad no you know they, no. They, so yeah, it's just an interesting you, point uh, a lot of the guys in, in our comments on on uh twitch are saying that you should be able to record footage are you going to try to do that Brian? are you going to take a capture card with that you? is very much my goal uh to come Great. home with footage like absolutely awesome. if i can't get it myself i'll try and uh Get it another way. Oh, another yeah. Way that shady man in the background. <laughs> Brian, Brian, hey, man. I got some Destiny 2 footage here. He opens up his cape, you know? Yeah. yeah you looking for the man with the coat. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. So, yeah, well, Brian, that's what I'm, let, I'm playing. Congratulations, Briar. That's Thank awesome. You. Yeah, I'm really looking that's forward awesome to going. Game. It's the first time I've been out to uh, a Bungie event, and I'm, you know, not only am I looking forward to. Uh, seeing Destiny 2, which is big, big excitement. But I'm also mm -hmm. looking forward to meeting some of the other Destiny creators, uh, no content kidding. creators. You know, uh, meeting some of you... the guys that do YouTube and Twitch. DCP crew. Yeah, that's it's true. My other crazy, podcast yeah. will be doing a live show from the event as well. You know, you're going to be a celebrity there. Are you prepared for that, Briar? Oh, yeah. I walk, I walk through the the streets of Connecticut every day, and it's just like pushing Ugly. people back. It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> that fame, <laughs> Brian, you know, it's like, <laughs> hold on, son, I don't uh, got time yeah. for no autographs. Keep it, I mean, it's ridiculous out here. It's no, I'm, in no way am I prepared for that, Beastly. I have no idea. I have like the worst person when even when somebody says nice job on something, I get like embarrassed, and I'm like. I don't even know how to react no, to it. You know, like, oh, oh. <laughs> so I, I have no idea how I'm going to. I guess it'll be prep for Guardian Con because I'll be going down to Guardian Con too mm -hmm. in uh, in July or June. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully this will help me get prepared for that. Get moment, prepared for that. It's going to be weird. Life. It's coming. <laughs> it's going to feel very do we, weird. Do yeah. we have any indications as well? Um, obviously, publicly, if it's been announced, but do we know? 
how long this reveal was going to be. I know it starts at a certain given time, but have they given... Because obviously they're bringing you guys down for a show. Is it yeah. probably going to be like the Call of Duty World War Two length? Maybe an hour, 90 minutes? Do I think you have any- normally Bungie likes to do like an hour. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a little longer just because it's you know it's a game and not a not an update DLC or a about. DLC. Uh, but, I mean, at the same time, you want to hold people's attention. You don't want to you know, just drone on forever. So I wouldn't be surprised to see you know a trailer, a little bit of gameplay... You know, some details, some hype, some big yep. wigs up on stage, and then like let's let's get it over with, and then then we get to play. Awesome! That's gonna be really exciting. Wilson man. in chat is saying, "I'm gonna go have Briar sign my T-shirt just to make it awkward." <laughs> <laughs> Wilson, fuck you, Dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna see Wilson at Guardian Con. I'm gonna give him a big hug, and I'm gonna awkwardly hold that hug like for far too long. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, maybe man, the man. maybe the hand drifts down a little bit too far, a little too close, a little too close to the butt. <laughs> Wilson, Wilson's doing I it all wrong. You don't butt. sign the T-shirt. You sign the titties. That's yeah. it. Man. Yeah, I see Brian just straight, straight across above above the man nipple. He's just. And what you also got to do? Give him a handshake and pull him towards you. Make yeah. him feel real good about that. What I'll do is I'll sign it real up high on his chest so he can't actually see what I'm doing and just draw a big Ooh. penis on there. <laughs> real nice, Briar. Real good image for a celebrity there. Yeah. You got to make uh, a name up. somehow. All right, we got yeah. some news to talk about. I can't wait to talk about it because there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up here. You want to get us started, Robbie? All right, guys. First bit of news today. Call of Duty World War II had its official reveal this week with an announcement trailer and lots of details that came from the live stream, including a private beta that will be available first on PS4 and the return of zombies in the form of the co-op mode with its own original story. The single-player campaign will follow Private Ronald Red Daniels, a 19-year-old soldier of the U.S. 1st Infantry Division. The game will have iconic World War II events such as the Normandy landings, of course, D-Day, and many other events primarily taking place in Europe during 1944 and 1945. The game's multiplayer component will have a brand new feature never before seen in Call of Duty called Headquarters. This multiplayer space will have up to a maximum of 48 players and seems to be similar to the social space in Destiny. It is unknown at this time if multiplayer matches will host 48 players or if that's just for Headquarters. I love how they call this brand new feature for Call of Duty Headquarters the same thing they used to call the old Call of Duty mode. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) What do you guys think of this trailer? I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's CG. It wasn't. It's CG. We didn't see any gameplay in this trailer. Oh, that, was, well, that was all in game footage. There were shots of in game though. footage was... of cutscenes. <laughs> right, but it will be kind of representation of what the final game looks like, just visually and all that. And I mean, personally, I loved the trailer. Personally, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, just it was really good, and just seeing a Call of Duty modern set in World War II, like, oh, I just, I really. Can't wait for this. This is it what did what a trailer is supposed again. to do, right? It got us hyped up for the next Call of Duty. I mean, it yeah. it it functioned, it performed its function very well. Did it a hell of a lot better than Infinite Warfare's trailer did? Oh Absolutely. my god, people are very <laughs> positive on this game compared to that game. Yeah, like it's completely different. Well, it, it seemed so gritty, and it made me feel like I was watching a Saving Private Ryan type of scenario. Mm, and it seemed right. like they're putting, yeah, yeah, they're putting a lot into this story as well. And of course, it was representative of the actual in-game footage. So the character models look great. I'm I'm super excited to see what the actual gameplay gameplay looks like. But just on the reveal trailer, it got me damn excited. And I went to YouTube and I, I looked at the thumbs up and thumbs down in the comments, and it was a polar opposite from what we've seen in Infinite Warfare. I mean, mm-hmm. Infinite Warfare got creamed in the comments and in the dislike bar, and it was 80 percent, 85 percent thumbs up for this. So it's it yeah. seems like it's a pretty Pretty well understood consensus that people are excited for Call of Duty going back to its roots, and it looks good. Looks there was really some stuff that we could pull from that trailer, though, that did get me excited for playing the game, and that was that gritty, more realistic look of it, and yeah. also the fact that there was some gore in that trailer. Yeah, it's yeah. hardcore. Oh, it's very lots dark. of blood, yeah. too. Yeah, limbs you know, kind of getting shut off, and yeah. Call of Duty has felt kind of sanitized for a while, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it used to be a pretty graphic game you know it used to be like if you go back to world of war you should be able to blow people's limbs off yeah, yeah it looks like they're going that's back how that, that time direction. period was though too so i mean this makes sense for it pretty sure that's how this time period is too <laughs> yeah no, i mean something else that we noticed as well was that if you look at other call of duty reveals especially infinite warfare they had the the bowie 
you know, Space Odyssey and um, things like that, you know, big budget Hollywood, well, Hollywood, um, you know, triple A studio produced music from I've listened to it a few times and it sounded like original score. It didn't sound like anything that was uh, a recognized mm -hmm. artist. And I think, like you say, it's stripping it back and it's it's not saying more is more. It's like less is more. It's a more human story. And for the first time in a long time, I'm excited to play a Call of Duty campaign, which is something yeah. that I haven't been Same for here. a long time. Same here. It seems very gritty and it, it pulled me in just watching that trailer. Uh, I think that it's gotten everybody like that, really. Uh, Briar, I know you don't really go for the campaigns, but after watching this reveal trailer, do you think that the campaign of World War II is worth visiting? Uh, the My problem with the campaigns of of Call of Duty, and I've said this before, so I'll keep it very brief, is not the stories or the characters. It's always that the, the constant progression of get to a checkpoint, kill wait, a bunch wave, of enemies, waves. move 10 feet forward, waves of enemies, 10 feet forward. It just... It gets tiring. It's been tiring for many years, and they have not evolved it. So if they evolve it here, I would be very happy to play a campaign. But if they don't, I will get sick of that very, very quick. Got you, yeah. got you. They also uh, showed a quick snippet of what we can kind of expect from the multiplayer as well, and it kind of shocked me because it showed characters on top of like a cliff looking down on about forty other characters. If we so get looks, like like battlefield level, th that's what's going to be. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I mean, I counted as much as I could, as best as I could. You guys know I made it to third grade, but I counted to uh, uh, forty or forty-one characters. So I'm thinking it's going to be quite a bit. It's going to well, be a huge a, number of players. There was the a couple more. of details uh, given around different game modes, and I think they mentioned like a, a domination style mode or a conquest style mode. Yeah, war um, is coming back in a different way, which sounded to me very similar to Battlefield One's their conquest yeah. sort of thing. How it was like the allies and the Axis, and you had to push. It's sort of like a tug of war type thing with multiple rounds, which I loved. I thought that was brilliant. And if they did that here too, that would be super super cool, especially for World War Two. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they yeah. haven't they haven't converted me back to COD player yet. Not, but mm. not by a long shot. Uh, but we're I want to see, you know, I want to see more of, you know, the single player. I want to see how it actually plays because they can make those things look fantastic in those like slow walk demos that they do on the E3 stage. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I want to see this in somebody's hand to see if this is that same old mm -hmm. checkpoint system that I'm so sick of. I also really looking forward to seeing the multiplayer reveal, which we usually don't see till later in summer. But I wouldn't be surprised if they. If they bump that up a little bit, um, and we're getting a demo, we're getting a beta of that game, so uh, yep. you'll be able to play it before it's released. I mean, for me, the acid test of a Call of Duty game is if you took Call of Duty off the title and just show me the trailer, would I care about the game? And to be honest, a lot of the space shooters, I wouldn't. They just look like generic space shooters. For this one, I haven't had a good World War Two shooter in forever. So yeah, yeah if, if you just called yeah. this World War Two, I can't believe we're having That's that conversation, Gary. Like it, there was a point not that yeah. long ago where it was like there was five call World War Two games released every year, right? And they all felt identical. It's it's amazing that yeah. we've come like full circle on this. Three sixty, <laughs> wink yeah. wink. All right, continuing on with our, our news for today, Resident Evil 7's free DLC, Not a Hero, has been delayed from spring to sometime later in twenty seventeen. God, you yeah. know it's like. We can't get any good games to come out in 2017. Like, all I'm <laughs> waiting for is just one fucking game DLC, to actually man. ship in 2017. It's been the worst year for video games ever. It's been like the, <laughs> like the worst year in video games ever. Nintendo has announced that the Switch has sold... Sorry, before, before we go on to that one there, I just want to quickly circle back to Resident Evil 7. Briar, I remember in January, was it January this came out? Yep. You picked it up and you said, for me, right now, game of the year. How's it standing in the rankings now, Resident Evil 7? Mm, great question, Gary. He's thinking about it. Oh, this might take a while. If the only competition it has in my eyes is Zelda. You don't think Horizon is, is up there with Resident Evil 7? No? I don't think it's up there. No, I don't. I think it's a beautiful game, but it feels like a, feels like a, a, a graphically better version of an older game. Okay, fair enough. Talking about The Witcher, huh? Witcher yeah. came out in like 2015. Yeah, but you said a graphically better version of an older game. No, I don't think I. I don't think Horizons is as good as The Witcher. Hmm. Okay. All right. So, am I free to go on now, Gary? You You are very free to. No, I Brian just. Oh, I so that, that was partially a joke, Gary, because it was January, and I was saying Game of the Year. 
the best yeah. game I played all year. It was the first yeah, game I played all year. Said, I remember that. The best you game I played statement. all year. And it's like, it's January. I'm yeah. going to hold you to it in December, bro. I'm coming back to that. <laughs> Destiny 2. What the f- who, what's Destiny 2? Resident Evil 7. You're all about it. Best game ever. Done. Yeah. Nintendo has announced that the Switch has sold 2,740,000 units uh, in its first month on sale. Wow. How many? Well. Say that one number again. Almost 3 million. 2,740,000. Wow. That's good. First month. That's it shocked me. I got to tell you, I didn't think the Switch would do this well just because you have Zelda and that's it. I just didn't see it. But, yeah, but this it's is Zelda. amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple. <laughs> it is a couple Zelda. Of- there's a couple of nuances to that as well, which which aren't well, captured in the headline. The Wii U. The <laughs> Nintendo's actual predictions were two million in the first month, and people million, thought they yeah. were being wildly um, overestimative. They, they thought they're never going to do two, never going to do two in no games. So they've exceeded the the expectation by almost fifty percent. And then what's also interesting is that Zelda Switch, forgetting Zelda Wii U, has actually sold over three million units. So they've sold more copies of Zelda than they have Switch units. <laughs> what the hell's happening? <laughs> How is it? I, mean, I bought two copies because it was so fucking good the first time. I couldn't wait to play it again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people have said that there's there's multiple copies. So with the collector's editions that come out, some people have bought the collector's edition to keep sealed and then maybe played another version. And maybe and some people apps. just buy a copy of Zelda just to lick it. Just an extra. The, well, the fact that <laughs> the Switch has been selling so heavily... So People have said that they've bought the Zelda game, but been unable to locate a copy of or a a piece of Switch. hardware. So they yeah. haven't got us. They've bought the game because they had it pre-ordered, but they haven't got the Switch yet. They're waiting I've for restocks. That. Well, yeah. Best Buys and Toys R Us has just got a uh, completely new Nintendo Switch um, units in. So there, you probably got a couple of days if you guys want to switch. Hey, Contact Toys R Us and Best Buy and get them now. While did you, can. you go to Best Buy last week and get an NES Classic? I, I just did my video on it. This I wasn't going to go. I sent my wife, and she was, uh-huh. you know, she's she's likes to sleep in till ten every day, but she got up early. She went to Best Buy when she got there. I was really excited. I was at work Monday. She was on her way there. They opened at ten. She got there. She said, "There's five people in front of me." I was like, "All oh, right, yes, I'm going to fucking have it." She called me about fifteen minutes later. She said the guy came outside and said they only had two. Uh-huh. So all, all, oh, no. all that all that hoopla all the news online all that crap you know i'm super excited she's up there and she says well do you think gamestop has them i was like probably not she went and stopped at a couple of gamestops nobody had it but they had two at, at best buy in morrow georgia and that really sucks that they made such a big you know a lot of noise about getting more in stock and they're only ship, shipping out two units that was yeah. really crappy yeah man. that sucks huh yeah I, I went i went to best buy but i was like your wife i showed up like right at 10 o'clock and same deal. There was a line. They were all. How many did they have? Uh, I, I didn't ask. I didn't count. Uh, but the people, I, it must have been five because there was like five people standing there buying them. Um, but yeah, it's like they had, they had gotten up at 7 a.m. and been standing in line since 7 a.m. You know, Jeez. to get those. So I was crazy. like, well, I got I to gotta either up my game or forget this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't no think I'm staying in line for four hours waiting for That's a, crazy, man. Waiting for Nintendo. a Nintendo NES Classic. <laughs> they literally have a way to print money with those things, man. People really, really want them. It's yeah. crazy that they stopped well, so soon. On, they should have just moving on to the Super them. NES. Well, Nintendo isn't known for always making great decisions. Uh, confusing literally everyone, Nintendo has announced a new 2DS XL this week, having the same power as the new 3DS line of systems. The system will cost $150 and will be out on July 28th. This is that clamshell Why? case, though. It's not like the old 2DS where it was like that. Oh, that, so really it is. That okay. triangle-looking thing, It looks right? nice. Yeah, it's just like yeah, a tablet. Yeah, it does actually like look nice. So okay, to good. me, this is genius by Nintendo. I actually take the complete opposite what? view. So my view is that you are you are phasing out. You're looking at a product that's being demised in the 3DS. They, they're obviously saying they're going to support it, and it's a product that will have a, a lineage moving forward in the same way that the Vita does. But the 3DS screens are expensive to produce. They're expensive to buy into the hardware to get new adopters to come into it. The 3DS 3D feature was one of the least used features by any consumers and something that no one wanted. Mm. It's more to break, more to produce, more to cost and more to buy into in the first place. $150 buy in for something that has the clamshell design so it protects. It has the processing power of the new 3DS. Great deal. it's, it's, It's a fantastic deal. It looks stunning. It plays stunning. It's got all the features that you want, and that the 3DS was an underused thing. So for me, if you've got the definitive version of the 3DS family, 
why not have this? I yeah, mean, I want it, to buy one anyway, and I've I've got hundreds of <laughs> DS products, you know. <laughs> well, so. I, you know, I, I got to agree with you there, Gary. Um, it's it's really interesting that Nintendo's going this direction. But one thing is very telling is they've completely walked away from 3D in general. If you look at the Nintendo Switch, it's adopted so many aspects of previous Nintendo products: the rumble, the motion controls, the screen, like the the Nintendo Wii U. They've like pulled from different g- generations of Nintendo products, completely foregoing the 3D aspect, which made the 3DS so popular. So 3D I'm was a gimmick, it, right? I mean, it, it's it's gone from everything. It's, you, yes. you don't buy TVs with 3D yep. in them anymore. You don't buy 3DSs. You buy the 2DS. I, I, I agree with you. Get to Gary. It seems you know it's like getting it's like putting out a PS3 light. You know, at the end of the yeah. life cycle for a PS3 or a PS2 or you know whatever. It's like yeah, some people are still going to want to buy these at a discounted price. Some people are going to have them break and still want to play their old PS3 games. Same with DS. Like I, I bet there's more breakage on DSs than there are most consoles, just because yeah. not because of the build quality, but because of you know the portability and the. Uh, age range of the targeted user base. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of these games don't even have 3D capabilities. If you right. played Pokemon Sun and Moon, you couldn't get 3D. It didn't work. You could put the 3D slider on, the game's not going 3D. So it was a, it was a dead functionality that, that Nintendo were having to pay to put into their hardware. Mm. So. It makes it makes all the sense in the world to me. It's just weird timing. I don't know. Like, in, why wouldn't you just get a Switch? Like, just save your money. It, I don't know. It's just... And the naming is weird. Like they name these things pretty terribly. So okay, you're you just going to confuse the hell out of people. That's if I didn't have stuff. a 3ds, I would I'd be happy to get a 2ds. And there's so oh, many games. Bucks too, please. Yeah, that's a great deal. It, you don't compromise on screen size. It's got the same 4.8 inch screen with the same resolution and the same processing power, and that's the most important thing. The old 2ds tablet, you you had a a tiny mm-hmm. little screen. You had the weaker capability. You you lost features. With yeah. this, you're you're gaining features, and you're getting it to a reduced power. price. Okay. All right. So Bethesda Games has teased at least two big game announcements to happen at E3 2017, uh, with an official image showing franchises that will appear in some way, along with unannounced projects that are quote under construction end quote. Have you guys seen the image? No. No. So basically, what it is, Bethesda they put out this image of all their franchises that are going to appear at E3 in some way. There's Fallout, there's Skyrim, there's Doom and stuff like that. You know, there's Prey, like all the ones we kind of expect. And then there's two other ones that they won't reveal. Like, they're teasing there's going to be a couple new announcements. There's one site that's under construction, and then there's another one that says coming soon. So (laughs) clearly there's going to be at least two games announced. People are saying either this is, you know, the new Wolfenstein or the new Colossus, which seems like it's going to happen, even within two, even within or it's even probably. possibly a new IP. It could be something like that. So, so Bethesda is doing their own conference again this year. Yes. Okay. Is there any wow. hope among the community that's a Skyrim? No, because uh, they've I'm already sorry. got I'm, I'm, Skyrim listed. So they've got Elder Scrolls for Skyrim. There's no hope that it's another Elder Scrolls. I'm, I said Skyrim. What I meant was like a new Elder Scrolls, Elder Scrolls game. Yeah, new, I, I highly I, doubt it. It's a new no, IP. Wait. So Elder Scrolls in, in itself is an IP, the franchise. Okay. So, so this they, is, these are new they franchises. They specified this is new franchises? Two, two. yeah. And that's what's interesting. Then, well, no, we don't actually know that. That's what people are speculating, though. That was not confirmed. That's These are just two unknown games. Mm. Did Bethesda say they're IPs? I don't think they said they are new IPs. Am I wrong about that? Uh, they said they're working on three games, two of which are bigger than anything we've worked before and will be new IPs. That's Bethesda Game Studios, not the publisher. That's where you're confused. Okay. Mm. Yeah, different story. But Bethesda also has this project supposedly called Starfield, which is a space RPG, which sounds really cool. That could be announced too, because that's from a separate team. Uh, space uh, uh, RPG, uh, you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from Bethesda Game Studios. So they have, you know, fantasy RPG, post-apocalyptic RPG with Fallout, and now a space RPG, potentially. Mm. That wow, that's really, that's, I like the sound of a, that. that sounds like might, something you might that's know. one that people are saying, along with Evil Within and stuff, that could be likely announced. A, a quick question. Do you guys think that Bethesda is going to show off uh, the Nintendo Switch Skyrim game at E3? Yeah. For sure. That's why so. Skyrim's there, and they're in their... Promo, definitely. Yeah, it's for the yeah. Switch. That makes sense. I'm interested in that game. That's one game that I definitely right. want on my Switch. Are you guys like, interested in Ghost of ET is like shouting Quake in the chat, and that's that's definitely gonna be there, right? Quake? Quake, Quake Champions. Champions. Yeah, that's yeah. that'll be there. Are you guys interested? Because in itself it wasn't a good game. 
but Fallout VR, Fallout 4 VR is being touted as a game changer for VR. Do you think that the experience, of, because Fallout 4 was a relatively vanilla and bland game, but do you think that the experience of being in a desolate post-apocalyptic wasteland will be significantly enhanced to play it in VR? Yes, Hell yes. Yeah. Give me Fallout 4 Hell VR, yes. please, right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Briar, oh my gosh. That would be insane. So I what? so want this game to come out. Like, I mean, it's... Really? Yeah, oh my god, I love Fallout, and Fallout 4 was, I thought, was what exactly what I thought I wanted, which I was wrong about, it was just more Fallout 3, but being mm -hmm. able to play that, in, be in that world in, in that 3D, world. Oh. like VR, oh my god, that sounds awesome. I mean, Gary, think of it this way, when you play Resident Evil 7 on just a regular monitor, versus being in the actual game with VR, it's a completely different experience. Who would choose just playing on a monitor when you can actually be in that world, and Fallout is a world that just keeps on giving, man. If they can make it an actual full-fledged experience, a real game, versus like Batman VR or some crap that only lasts for three hours, if it's a real game with real meaningful environments, characters, and items you can find and craft and, you know, do what you do in Fallout, I'm down, man. Especially if you can use your controller and move around the same way you do in regular Fallout games. I don't think anybody would I mean, protest that. For me, it's you mentioned um, Resident Evil there, and the reason that I asked the Fallout question is I, I didn't really enjoy Resident Evil 7 on a controller. I didn't enjoy it in VR either. Like, if I don't enjoy the game, um, will I enjoy it in VR just because it's in VR? Oh, man, uh, you just lost some cool points, brother. So for me, Gary, the difference is is that I do fundamentally enjoy Fallout, right. right? It was just that Fallout 4 just felt like more Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. It didn't feel like it had changed enough. Mm -hmm. But Agreed. if all of a sudden I could step into that world, that's enough of a change, I think, yeah. to get me to really... God damn, like, just ex the way you explore, I hope it's not, like, teleport and, like, you yeah. know, point and teleport. I Batman. hope it's just you walk around yeah. and you can be in the world of Fallout because that's, that's not something we've seen in any VR game so far. That'd be, you know, that'd be next level. I mean, it's got the VATS targeting system, so I guess it lends itself quite well to VR because it doesn't need precision oh, aim either. So I, I can see your point. It just asked the question because I know that you guys gave Fallout 4 a rough time when it first came out. So. Yeah, I certainly did. Well, these assholes did. I really like the game, and I still do. <laughs> Not as much as Fallout 3, I will say. I didn't love it as much as 3 in New Vegas. It was still great, though. I thought it was. Oh, Robbie, speak it up. I like Anyways, that. moving oh, yeah. on, you dicks. <laughs> <laughs> too far, Robbie. Too far. Dude, too far. Too <laughs> far. <laughs> All right, our, our last bit of news for episode 153, Beastly Thoughts Live. Digital game sales have now overtaken physical copies by a large margin. In 2016, digital sales were an average 74% of all games sold, while June, just 26% were physical copies. So Did you hear that? Yeah. That was, that yeah, was, was the sound player. of the GameStop CPO puking on his shoes. <laughs> no, Briar, this, this, him crying, this is what too. You've been He's saying, crying. Briar, you've been saying this for years. You know? Now, this is actually interesting. There's a couple of nuances to this story as well, which before we get into the discussion, I wanted to clarify. It's been stated year on year that gaming is dying and that less games are being sold and that games oh, aren't going anywhere. That's silly. The reason that that was being said is that digital games weren't being factored counting. into the, yeah. the counting. So they've now reintroduced digital sales, at least in North America. And it's actually shown that year on year gaming sales have actually been increasing by 5% on average wow. um, and that digital sales are there. What also makes this uh, interesting, the 74% digital sales doesn't factor in two of the most or well, two of the largest games, digital games distributors, that being PlayStation Network and Xbox Live, because they decided this isn't compulsory to release your sales figures and they didn't want to introduce them. So if right. you factor 74% of games are digitally sold, not including PSN or Xbox Live, the wow. real figure's probably going to be Much far higher. more skewed. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I buy every single game digitally now. I very rarely buy physical copies. I just like digital. I like it being in that library and being accessible. It's convenient. I, I buy digital 99% of my PS4 games because I have three of my own PS4s. So I get to game share. I can play in the living room. My wife can play on her right. PS4. So to me, it makes perfect sense. But uh, over the last two years, I used to just collect games. You guys know me. Yeah. I don't do yep. it anymore. It's like my, my collection has kind of grown stagnant. It's been sitting still looking the same for like the last 18 months because for the most part, I don't buy physical copies anymore. For me, that's part of the benefit is that I don't have to have this shit clogging up my house i don't have to have shelves shelves full of fucking cases that you're right 
You know, like you're so right. All that room in my house is that usable space as opposed to just taking up spaces of boxes and you know games that I don't care about. I, I will say the one thing I, I still don't feel like the value pop propositions there. It's pretty good over on Steam, but like if you buy a game retail over at GameStop, even though you, you know once you have a retail copy, you can resell that game and get a little bit of money back. Where that's not really going to happen for you on uh, PSN Digital. or Xbox. Yeah. You know? True. Yeah. So yeah. that's actually um, partly to do with GameStop, as you say, Brian. So digital distribution, the developers and the publishers could supply the games far, far cheaper, but they anchor them to store retail prices so as not to immediately put GameStop out of business because they need them as a retail presence and something to advertise and market their games. So like you say, the retail proposition isn't there, but that's because there is still, um, uh, I guess, a distribution network they have to align to, whether or not the cost makes sense. So well, that's that. I mean, for I, me, I, I, I I'm on the other side of, of that. I think that this whole uh, argument can be summed up by uh, Mikasta, uh, 21. He said it's easier to sit at home in your underwear and wait till midnight to unlock a game instead of going out uh, for midnight releases. I think that's what it all Yeah, but it's oh, fun to go to those midnight yeah. releases. I still go. I still I'm go. I'm completely the other side of you guys on this argument. You, you guys seem to have gone digital. Yeah. I'm still a collector. You know from – you've seen what I buy. No, yes. I have. You're I, crazy. You bought like three videos. That's like half of all have been sold. Over a lifetime. <laughs> Ravi, thug, white, goddamn. Four Vitas, man. Savage, I'm propping it up. Real on this episode. You'll see this this month there'll be four Vitas sold, which will be there. Um, no, for, for, <laughs> Good for, for me, I, I'm, I really don't like the idea of purchasing something digitally because I feel like I'm not actually buying it. I'm give, being given an indefinite license to it, which can be revoked yeah. at any time. I don't have something that is mine. Um, that I can take and I can look at and I can cherish and hold. I get a lot of satisfaction from seeing those that um, shit, as you call it, Briar, yeah. on the shelf. You know, I, that to me is is satisfaction. My my dollars are well spent um, in buying that. So I mean, how, do you guys not feel that your digital collection has less residual? Um, I guess you see what what BC showing that less residual value to you. For you me, know, you Gary, can't, it's, you can't. It's got more residual value because I'm more likely to play it if it's already on the console. If I just scroll through and say. Oh shit! I haven't played Journey in like a year. Let me check that game out again. Or on the PS Vita, where I I just pick up the console, and I had you know a, a bunch of games that are just preloaded on the console that I could start playing, as opposed to getting the console then trying to figure out where the hell I've stashed those games that are four years old now. Well, mm-hmm. this is this is the only issue I have at this point with digital downloads. At some point in time. All these networks are going to disappear. All these servers are going to disappear. Yeah. And and what do you do at that point? It's like now I can still play my Super Nintendo games, my Dreamcast games, my PlayStation 2 stuff, my PS3 stuff. I got tons of it. At some point in time, these servers are going to go away and they're just going to move away from what's considered very old games. And what do you do at that point? As we move on with the current architecture that the PlayStation and Xbox and certainly the PC are kind of doing, though, it's like these games are just never going to... Theoretically, it could be that these games are just never out of date. Right, you can play all your Xbox One games on an Xbox Scorpio, mm. and you can play all your Xbox Scorpio games on the Xbox Scorpio Two, and mm. all your X, you know. So hopefully, if they just keep building on this current architecture instead of just fucking with the architecture every time they release a new console, you know, it may this problem may be gone. Right, Nintendo's still fucking it up as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know the <laughs> fact that yes, I can't are. play the virtual console games I bought on the Wii, on the Wii U, and then again on the Switch. Go fuck yourself, Nintendo. I'm not buying any of those virtual console games. because No voice cause chat even on the console. You're just trying to screw me over. That's not at all what we're talking about, Robbie. That We're talking about video know, games. That's just them being behind. That's why I brought that up. <laughs> I know. Savage, what, we're talking, what we're talking about here is you know the, the losing the right to play a video game that you purchased. And that's a real concern for digital, digital mm. purchases. I think that's a concern even more for uh, game streaming services like PlayStation Now. I know people have talked about that, that you're literally streaming a game. You don't own it even digitally. You're just streaming it. You yeah, rent but it. why do you need to own it digitally? Why do you need to own it, really? I know there's just people out there that feel that way, so I just like even to Even bring the that games up. that Gary has on his shelf, he doesn't yeah. actually own those games. He owns, he owns a digital copy of them copy and, a, of and them. a user license to play it. Well, I mean, I own a yeah. physical, a, a physical. Um, you own a physical copy of it, yeah. But you have a, you more 
as far as the video game publishers are concerned, you have you have bought a license to play that game. Whether you own a physical copy or a digital copy, they don't see it any differently. Well, it's still it's still your property. It's like yeah, you know, the disc is your property. The game is not. I get yeah, what you're saying, I mean, Briar. Yeah, I see. But, you. but the game is the disc, though. So I mean, I don't know if it's is a it? psychological thing for yeah. me, specific to games, because I've got no issues with going digital on my other media. So mm-hmm. um, music. I wouldn't think about having a CD collection. I'm quite happy to have it all on Spotify TV. and not really own it. Agreed. Netflix. Yes. Netflix, Amazon, no problems there. Take all my DVDs and Blu-rays away. Happy to do it. They're Throw just that shit away. out, man. But games, I have a... It, again, it might be a personal thing for me that I feel that I need to have the instruction manual, the box, the, the thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm just old-fashioned in my collector's thing, but I've always grown up with them, and I've, I still have boxes for games that I had from like 2002 1998 like i've still got them because to me they're it's important. a special feeling if it's it brings you feeling. joy too there's no reason not to do it there's no reason not to do it if you're out there buying vinyl records and that brings you joy to do it you know that's fine i'm not i'm not advocating that you should not buy the shit on the shelves i that was poorly worded and insensitive of me of word it that way because if you if you enjoy going out and collecting these things and like having a complete nes collection or a complete vita collection that's fucking awesome and actually the world's a better place because there are people who actually put these collections together in one spot so that there are these collections right but for well, me it's just shit on a wall <laughs> like it's just shit taking up space shit on it, the wall and it, it's like it's special, I, i'm man. very happy the digital future to me i i am the guy who threw away Boxes of VHS tapes, Me too. boxes of CDs, boxes of DVDs. Like I've yeah. gone through these progressions, mm-hmm. and it hurts every time you do it because you you think to yourself, you know how many fucking thousands of dollars I just threw away. <laughs> Whereas yeah. if I had bought, you know, now if I buy a movie on iTunes, mm-hmm. assuming iTunes doesn't disappear, I could go back and watch that on a 4K TV mm-hmm. or on an 8K TV. It doesn't matter. The format isn't going to change, right? Mm. But Briar, it does feel kind of special, right? To to have you know games like this. It feels special copies. to you. Yeah, it it does. You know, to and actually have have the manual and have the disc, or you yeah. know, and co- games are like considered collectors' items, like Kotor, you know, Knights of the Old Republic. These are special, meaningful things. Of course, you can play the the digital re-releases or uh, backwards compatible versions, but having this and holding this in your hand, it feels kind of special. You know, yeah. the original Odin spear. Just to say that you have it. I've I've had while this you were years. up while you were away, Beastly. I, I kind of explained that. Yeah, I don't. I if you if that's what makes you happy, that's great, man. Like you, do it. I'm not saying okay. don't do it. Gotcha. I'm just saying for, in my life, I'm very happy with the digital feature. <laughs> I just Me too. my my, I'm totally my concern and the thought that I wanted to kind of close that that conversation on and my thoughts on is the trend is alarming that it's spiking digitally at such a rate. And as soon as you give away your your rights as a consumer to have control over your purchases, my my worry is that you know, like you say, bro, if you've got everything digital, what say if if PlayStation Plus now says next month it's or your next year it's going to be two hundred dollars now if you want access to your stuff? Mm-hmm. I well, mean, what do you do at that point then? You you don't give them two hundred dollars for one thing. You let PlayStation die as a brand because there is competition. This is why we always do want competition in these spaces. Yeah, but that's, that's a, why that's right. last... when when somebody you know starts saying that you're, you're a dumbass for buying an Xbox because PlayStation is clearly better, I say you know console wars do not serve anybody any good. That's you know, just so immature and stupid. Don't even get into console wars. I, yeah. I honestly think that shit's like, childish. Because that like, is just the kind of feature you, you could on. expect is if one console company all of a sudden had you know the entire space to themselves, there's no reason they wouldn't start fucking us over on the regular. Yeah. <laughs> You're totally right. No you reason. are absolutely right about that. Without competition, things would be a lot different than they are. Well, totally. Look, companies like Sony, Sony just released their financial report for fiscal year 2016. They were only uh, getting money or receiving positive revenue from their PlayStation brand. Everything else last year completely fl- flopped and failed for place- for Sony. Now, if Sony were to go through bankruptcy or go through some form of litigation where they lost their rights to the PlayStation or things got really bad, every digital game you have would disappear. It would all disappear. The, the, the well, Netflix that, that's not right necessarily things. true, Beastly. No, I think they'd sell the rights to probably another company. Maybe they'd acquire that service. I think they would probably just sell those assets off was what would happen. Well, as a consumer, no matter what, you're going to be in some form of trouble. 
because they're only going to sell off those assets to a company who wants to make money. And, and what's the point of making money on something that you already bought? So that's, it's bad that's for the true. consumer regardless. That, this is the that's fear true. with the digital future on movies, on music, on everything, right? Uh, hopefully, like if, if we ever got to a point where we have a Spotify service type of service for video games, I would so sign up for that immediately. That. Like that, oh, that would be that sick. to me is yeah. so sick. Like just pay a monthly fee and have access to any game you wanted, as opposed yeah. to purchasing individual games. Oh, dude, hell yes! Phil yeah, Spencer please. did an interview uh, last week. I forget exactly who he was uh, talking to, but he made a statement. I'm paraphrasing, but he said uh, that he wants the Xbox to become the Netflix of gaming. And if that is the case, that's a great direction to go. As long as we don't have to worry about networks and servers going down, it'd be a great idea. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing with uh, Xbox Game Pass as well. That seems their like their model step towards their that. model is much cooler than Sony's too, because you actually download the game and play it locally. Yeah, but you're not dealing with the with the lag. That you oh, are for on. backwards compatibility? Yeah, yeah, that's totally local. Yeah. Because you can just put the disc in, and you're basically em playing it. It's just emulated. So, Robbie, you're you're fucking up the silence. <laughs> okay, I can't. There are no easy <laughs> solutions to these problems, right? This is a we're we are living in a world that is we're you know we're going through uncharted territory here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's definitely an interesting team to, time to be alive and the best time ever to be a gamer, if you ask me. This oh, is yeah. unbelievable. For sure. For sure. 2017 has been one of the greatest years in gaming so far for me. Um, it's been awesome. My Switch, all these great games have been released. And we're not even halfway done with the year. I think this is going to... It's insane. It's going to be nuts. <laughs> oh, God. It's, it's going to be crazy. Especially these E3. This is uh, a pretty important one for especially Microsoft and I think Nintendo in particular. I can't wait they till Sony announces the PS5 and we do our show after that. Oh, uh, my God. I, and I, I, look Briar, I look Briar right in his eye and oh, say, man. what did I say? All right, so what's the bet? You, you're saying that PS5 is getting announced this year? Yes. Okay, Dude. what's the bet? What are we doing here? What do you, what do you want to bet? I don't how know. Many of my kids, how many of my kids do you want? Uh... <laughs> The so, like, if you win, I take right? your kids? Is that what you're saying? And if I win, you take mine? If, you, if I win, you, <laughs> if, if I win, you take my what kids. If I lose, oh my you can have my kids. <sighs> what? Well, right. That's risky business. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why you'd want to lose your kids over a video game. All right. How about I this? If, 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 it, if it's announced at E3 this year, I'll shave my head. Okay. But if it's Ooh. not, you have to grow your hair out. For how long? Uh, until it is announced. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. I love this. Yes, let's, let's do this. I, what I'm hearing is no confidence from Beastly right now. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing Beastly back away. He's just like, oh, shit, I might not be so right anymore. Pretty show. Briar was just talking about cutting his hair real short, too. So... Okay. <laughs> you win no matter what. Can I get in on this too? Will I have to shave my head, Gary? You got you got to grow a beard, Robbie. <laughs> oh God, that's tough. I'll try though. <laughs> I, don't I, just wanna... I don't know if it'll be a free announcement, Briar, but I got a strong feeling that it'll be this year before it's Scorpio. It Maybe might be. we'll do like what Microsoft did last year, though. I can see that in a way. There, there's an know. analyst. There's an analyst that just came out. The same guy who um, who said that they were making a slim PS4 and the PS4 Pro before they either were announced. He said that PS5 will be uh, uh, revealed and and I think release before holiday 2018. I saw that. Just yeah. It'll be revealed before 2018. No, released. Before holiday 2018. Wow. Yeah, in the second half of the year. Yeah. So I'll be I honest mean, with you. I'd be incredibly happy if you're right, Beastly. Like me this too, would. God damn I'd it. be. Are you kidding me? Another another PlayStation? Hell yeah. <laughs> but I don't think our opinions would be shared by everybody. <laughs> they won't. Hell they no. Won't. They won't. You know, I, I talk to people about this in the comments of my videos a lot. They say, Beastly, it's too soon. But if you think about it, right, 2018 is five years after the PS4 was released. We all complain. True, and moan about but they and went and released the PS4 Pro in between. Yeah, yeah so but, is that too but, soon or is that just, you know, this is optional for people? You can't conflate, conflate the two of those. 
because the PS4 Pro is still just a PS4 and it looks a little place. bit better. I'm completing over here, I'm completing here. God right damn over it, there. Man. Conflation right up in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> All up in my face. Look, the PS4 Pro is still just a PS4. It just plays games a little bit better than the PS4. There's yeah. no exclusivity it is still to a it. PS4 Pro. You know, it's, yeah, and it's an optional PS4. thing too. I think it's either part of it. So, so maybe so it won't five, even count. A five-year life cycle. They count the PS4 Pro sales with the PS4. So it's still the same thing. When they do NPD numbers, they don't separate the two and say PS4 Pro sold this many in PS4. It's all counted as one. I think Sony. Looks will it at be? The, will the, the PS5 one. be? Like backward compatible with PS4? Yes, from what I hear, from what I hear yeah. from these these articles that I've read, yeah, it's going to be completely backwards compatible with the PS4 and supposedly ten teraflops. So, <sighs> so many a flops. lot of flops, oh man. Man, there's be flopping shit everywhere. Dude, there's too many Here, flops. Flop I can't there. hold these flops in. So, I mean, and imagine that, right? The Xbox Scorpio, this is something that I just talked about in one of my videos that nobody has really said anything about. Everybody's saying the Scorpio won't have exclusive games. It'll only be Xbox One games, and that's what we've all heard, right? And it'll all be just Xbox One games playing at a higher resolution on the Scorpio. But the right. fact that the Scorpio is VR compatible and there are no VR games on the Xbox One lets you know that they are planning some form of exclusivity for the Xbox Scorpio. Why would they add that functionality if the Xbox One doesn't have a VR setup? Xbox yeah. One, as it stands right now, doesn't have VR games. So, so why would the Scorpio there will be, have, in fact, there will be exclusivity. Scorpio has to be. exclusives? I it has to be. Why would they have VR if, if, if uh, you know, Xbox One has no point. VR games? Maybe they yeah, just was, run at a lower resolution on the Xbox One? <sighs> I, I don't even know. Well, the Xbox One, I don't know if it would even be capable of that. They'd have to add so much stuff. It doesn't have the power of the PS4. Yeah. Anything's possible. So. All you got to do is lower the resolution. <laughs> it's just... I you mean, it's it back. Call it back. Call it back. But, You're playing sounds, Pong in VR. It's fucking likely. magical Pong, but it's Pong. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is more more reasonable idea? Do you think that they would actually go back and do that and pretty much shit all over the Xbox One owners or have exclusive titles for the Xbox Scorpio that run in VR? I'll say I think there will be exclusives for Scorpio, but that will be two to three years in. That won't be immediately. I think that'll be a couple of years in. So, so I think that's what, what will happen. You'll see cross, you know, compatible with both, and then they'll slowly phase out the Xbox One, and it'll be just Scorpio. Is there enough USB not. ports on an Xbox One to support Oculus Rift, Gary? Uh, there's three. Uh, absolutely yeah, three. not. No, nope. there's only one controller. It, it can't do it. So I, I think we won't see exclusives for the Scorpio. We may see exclusives for the Xbox VR, which are playable on the Scorpio, um, mm. possibly that way. There may be a way around it with some sort of clause or get a gel free card with it. But I don't see the Oculus in its current state going to anywhere except the PC. It's not fit for purpose for a console. So what do you think Xbox will get its own VR headset? I think it will get Oculus um cv2 is it consumer version 2 maybe because we're on cv1 at the moment so whatever cv2 looks like that or it's... maybe oculus and them will work together and maybe they'll make a vr headset specifically for xbox one i could see them partnering up for well that they, they, they're already partnered don't you get xbox uh don't you get an xbox controller with it yes that's yeah, why that's, i'm saying that's, they that's, yeah, but microsoft not does not say they say very far away like people have asked specifically <laughs> Is the Xbox Scorpio going to be compatible with the, or is the Rift going to be compatible with the uh, Scorpio? And they, they just, they are not saying. Hmm. Yeah. Well, no matter how you look at it, if they put uh, VR on the Scorpio, those are going to be Scorpio exclusives because they're not going to play on the Xbox One. So it's going to get some form of exclusivity. Maybe. I mean, I'm, maybe. I'm sure we'll find That's out. Strong speculation. I wouldn't say it's 100. percent Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I can sleep with that. Who knows? It's an exciting time, though. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited. You know, just being on a show with you, answer. handsome guys, I'm always excited. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. Right? Ditto. Right? This Ditto is a strong you, show, sir. guys. I like this show. I like it when we start arguing about shit, too. It's just fun. Not Fuck arguing. I don't like arguing disgusting. With you. Strongly disgusting. That's because I'm uh, always right, Beasley. I, I know it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. <laughs> I'm arguing to, um, with you right now about arguing. I, I don't like arguing with you. Man. Two points to close the show. We are now an official podcast. We are on Podbean and we're on iTunes. We'll keep plugging it until you guys start listening. So uh, there you go. Listen, damn it. Listen, damn it. Maybe we should podcast. play it at the beginning of the show because nobody's fucking listening anymore. Um, <laughs> I think it's also worth the disclaimer, which we should add at the end of all shows because we now are officially on iTunes. 
The Beastly Thought Show does not condone the sale of children in any way, shape or form, whether it financially or non-financially. Uh, all thoughts are expressed are the guests and their own. I don't know yes. if I agree with that. I think we might want to review that as a podcast and come to a consensus. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh my gosh, Briar. <laughs> I gotta get these. I gotta get these little shitheads out of my house. Come on, it man. costs a lot of money to feed these fuckers. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> All these video games, you know, I can save up some of these ramen noodles for myself. You know? Shit. Who needs to feed your own kids? Yeah, no, just no more ramen for you, right? Cost I'm not me too saying much. they're not gonna get fed. Just somebody There's else might food. be doing the feeding. Right. <laughs> we, we, we always got cat food. I can hear it now. Daddy, what's for dinner? You want dry or wet? <laughs> oh no that, okay, it's saturday that means we got the wet <laughs> <laughs> we got the canned food <laughs> what is that tuna God, no it's canned the... cat food is the worst oh. digitally recorded child abuse this is going to be used in a court case against you one day basically yeah this is yeah. <laughs> we're on really fine ground here oh and the, div God. the divorce lawyer is going to love this podcast <laughs> he's going to be having a field I, day with this like, be in court, yes. I'm say, if the can didn't open down. you just hoping shit <laughs> <laughs> Beast, these our generation's OJ right here. I think it's time to wrap. <laughs> All right. Done. Thank you guys so much for watching. We appreciate it. I don't know what to, I don't know where to go from here. Bye. So, our generation's OJ. I gotta get me a white bronco.